Thank you for joining me today. Okay. Um, here's some of my other ways to keep in touch with me. I am most active on Instagram. And so if you want to um, follow me and my office is there to see all the information that we're posting on female sexual dysfunction and chronic pelvic pain and orthopedic issues, please take a look at us there. So we're going to be going over um, female sexual dysfunction from my lens, which is a pelvic floor physical therapist. And I really wanted to tailor this conversation for sex therapists. So if there are any other like maybe medical professionals listening, um, you know, this is not specifically tailored to you, but you'll still get a lot of good information from that. So I want you to understand our role uh, as pelvic floor physical therapists in providing care to your clients. I want you to be able to help identify when a client may be appropriate for a pelvic physical therapy referral, and also help understand the methods that we use in our evaluation and treatment of these disorders so that you can in turn help better prepare your clients for what to expect uh, in their first visits and maybe subsequent visits and what the overall goal is of pelvic floor physical therapy therapy for female sexual dysfunction. And we will be talking about the pathoanatomy a little bit so that it, you can just better help support your clients clinically. So how common is female sexual dysfunction? We know that it is underreported and inadequately treated. And part of this lack of treatment is due to really the lack of quality integrative care for these patients. The, um, you know, not being able to recognize the broad scope of what female dysfunction is and all the possible things that can drive it from not just the level of the pelvic floor, but even orthopedic problems that may be contributing to their pain or dysfunction. 43% of women experience female sexual dysfunction at some point in their lives. So I put this statistic up here to really bring home the point that this is not a rare disorder or a rare cluster of disorders that we are all treating. Um, they're just, you know, it's obviously really stigmatized. So we have to really help be advocates for our patients and reach out to potential referral sources and let them know that they may be missing a, um, a, a sort of huge component of someone's overall well-being by not addressing sexual function. Because, I mean, we're nearing one in two, and, and that's a pretty um, astonishing number for really how little we hear about it in, in the general media. It can be difficult for providers to diagnose female sexual dysfunction, and part of the reason is there is a lack of lab findings and a lack of visible pathology. Many patients are sent to practices such as yours. They're sent to sex therapy. They're sent to psychotherapy because, you know, maybe they think the problem's just in their head. Uh, you know, they peed in a cup. There was no infection. They did a gynecologic exam. They swabbed the tissue. There was no infection. There were no abnormal findings on, on their ultrasound. So I don't know, maybe the pain's just in your head because I don't quote unquote see anything, but um, you know, as a pelvic floor PT, we feel things and we take into account what we feel and what we observe uh, functionally and biomechanically um, along with their history. So it is completely appropriate that they are sent to a sex therapist or psychotherapist because there is a mind component. But just keep in mind that there needs to be a total body component that's addressed along with that. Um, not just a pelvic floor component, and that will become more evident as I go through this lecture. Um, another reason why it can be difficult to diagnose is this idea of neuronal crosstalk. And basically, some of these more similar chronic pain or sexual pain diagnoses that you are probably familiar with, like interstitial cystitis and painful bladder syndrome, vulvodynia, endometriosis, have um, similarities in their uh, mechanisms of action and pain production. And part of this is the theory of convergence where we get different nerves, um, or I'm sorry, we get convergence of input from different organs um, on the spinal cord nerves. And just as an example, we know that nerves that are near each other um, do affect other nerves and organ and muscles and tissue in the area. Um, I have this diagram up here and I have three different nerves that are listed. I have this iliohypogastric nerve, this ilioinguinal nerve and the genitofemoral nerve. And all three of those nerves have 
multiple nerve roots that they are originating from, but one nerve root that they have in common is the first lumbar. So if you look up here, this is L1, first lumbar. That's pretty far north of the pelvic floor. So if somebody is having pelvic floor symptoms, maybe it's actually coming from their first lumbar. And this is one reason why, you know, people go to see a gynecologist for labial pain or labial numbness or clitoral pain. And the gynecologist is not looking at their lumbar spine. And I think sometimes they're forgetting that those nerves that are originating higher up on the spine um, can actually be producing pelvic floor symptoms. And then once the symptoms are diagnosed, they can be difficult to access. You know, this is, these are just a few things that were listed in a hysterectomy population, but think about it. We live in Los Angeles and um, people don't want to drive. I mean, people are used to driving, I guess, an hour or two hours, but if you have to see somebody once a week and you're signing up for an hour one-way commute, you have your hour session, you got to go an hour back, that's three hours out of somebody's day. And a lot of people just really can't afford that time, even for something that's really important for them. Um, and I especially think with female sexual dysfunction, it can be easy to avoid um, because they don't necessarily have their symptoms all the time, depending on what their disorder is. If they have vaginismus, for example, it only hurts if they maybe try to put in a tampon or they try to have sex. And otherwise, they don't have any pain. So it's something that they can really easily avoid and may deprioritize because of that. And obviously, another barrier to accessing services could be the financial constraints. Um, we know that our services tend to not be well um, reimbursed by insurance. So a lot of us are out of network and patients come out of pocket and then they may not be reimbursed really well. So there are really a lot of barriers in place for these patients once they are finally diagnosed. So what are these diagnoses that fall under um, female sexual dysfunction? And what uh, should you as sex therapist be keeping your ears like tuned in for when you're interviewing your clients? And I apologize, this is probably hard for you to read on your computer, but I do have it listed out again later on the slide. But I like it presented like this because female sexual dysfunction is a subtype of pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and if it's a pain disorder, a subtype of uh, chronic pelvic pain. And look at how many possible things it might be. It could range from adhesions like scar tissue or fascial adhesions to um, vestibulodynia to uh, pelvic organ prolapse to endometriosis. These providers, the primary providers that are diagnosis, diagnosing these, have a lot of different things to consider um, when looking at pain. And I've only included the local contributors to pain on here, not the, um, the lumbar and thoracic spine contributors that may be a component of their pain as well. So... Um, Specific to this lecture, we are talking about female sexual function, and we know that there are four domains of female sexual function. There's desire, arousal, orgasm, and pain. And where pelvic floor physical therapy can come in and be a part of that team is with um, orgasm dysfunction or pain disorders. And of course, those in turn will help with desire and arousal along with what is happening in their um, sex therapy and psychotherapy sessions because you think about how aroused are you going to be if you're expecting it's going to hurt. So there's going to be that mind interaction that patients and clients will need to get um, to help get through. But also, you know, it affects other aspects of their life. If they can't be, um, if they can't have intercourse, let's say, then they may in turn stop being intimate altogether. And then not being intimate, we know how that will probably impact other areas of their relationship. So um, working as a team with sex therapists and physical therapists, we can address all four domains together. So here's that list I promised you. So hopefully this is a little bit easier to read. And so for the first few on the left, it may be more obvious to you and you may already be working with pelvic floor PTs um, with these specific diagnoses. And I'm not going to define them. Feel free to ask me a question if you're unsure of what everything is. But I figure if you are working with this population, then you are probably at least familiar with like the basic definitions of these. And I don't want to take time out of this hour lecture to go over those basics. 
Um, but I have included some other things on here that I personally put under female sexual dysfunction because it does impact their bedroom activities. So for example, if they have urinary incontinence or white bladder leakage or bowel incontinence, that's creating an obvious hygiene issue. And that in turn may lead to them not wanting to be intimate because maybe they are concerned of smells or they might have skin breakdown because of the moisture that's been sitting on their skin. That's what happened. Our skin is meant to be dry. And if things become uh, you know, moist against it and are held um, moist against the skin for a long time, it can cause skin breakdown or at the very least, you know, an irritation or a redness. Um, also general orthopedic conditions, which I have listed here in the lower right hand corner, those can also contribute to issues in the bedroom. If they have hip pain or back pain, that's going to affect their intimacy too, um, affect what positions they can get into. So we can address from an orthopedic perspective, what positions may be comfortable for them if maybe their main limiting factor might not even be coming from their pelvic floor. It might be because they have hip arthritis or a herniated disc, for example, but they still want intimacy. They still want to um, have intercourse in whatever way they view that with their partner. Um, another population, which sometimes people just don't think about because it's a really neglected population and these um, you know, issues when you're postpartum or postmenopausal just tend to be normalized, unfortunately, because they're so common. Um, in the postpartum population, I have down here in red, 89% of women um, that have delivered a baby experience painful sex on their first attempt after delivery. And that's whether their first attempt is six weeks after delivery or six months after delivery. So it's not that it's, you know, six months ago and of course they have sex. Some women waited six months and they still had, um, they still had pain on their first attempt. And the other um, not so surprising thing to me, but what's so surprising when I talk to people about this study is that the higher incidence of painful sex actually occurred in women with elective C-sections, with um, emergency sections, and with a traumatic uh, vaginal delivery, for example, like a forceps assisted vaginal delivery. And the slightly lower percentage in women that had a natural uncomplicated vaginal childbirth. Um, so that is on their first attempt. And this was a study that was done in over 1,200 women um, and published in an international OBGYN journal just a couple of months, or I'm sorry, just a couple of years ago. Um, in this same study, a follow-up was looked at 18 months later. So this is after multiple attempts at intercourse. And 40% of postpartum women reported ongoing painful sex, which is a huge number. We're, we're talking again, almost half of women 18 months after they have delivered, which is several months after they've stopped breastfeeding, maybe several months to a year after they've stopped breastfeeding. And these women are told that, um, you know, just give it time, like, you know, the pain will get better after you stop breastfeeding. So one, that's clearly not the case. Um, two, uh, at some point, women maybe just normalize it because a lot, maybe they open up to like their friends or their family, and they have those symptoms too. And we know how common it is. But just because something is common does not mean that our body is in a normal state, right? Like if people have back pain, sure, lots of people have back pain, but it's not normal to have back pain. But for some reason with female sexual dysfunction, it is sort of looked at as a, um, as a dysfunction that is normalized. Um, the other thing too that you may not be familiar with pelvic PT treating, because I tend to not get these referrals from sex therapists, are painful orgasm or lack of orgasm or diminished orgasm or a persistent genital arousal disorder, um, pers persistent sexual arousal syndrome. So we can evaluate for that and determine if um, there is something musculoskeletally or something with their pelvic floor muscle coordination, for example, that is contributing to that dysfunction. So dysfunction doesn't just mean pain. It can mean um, other orgasm difficulties um, as well. So. That's sort of the, the point I want to make there. Um, there are also lots of non-female sexual dysfunctions that we treat in um, pelvic PT. So um, urinary symptoms, bowel symptoms, um, nocturia, which is nighttime voiding, is actually very huge in, a, in our chronic pain population. So uh, for example, our patients with endometriosis that really just have pain all the time or vestibulodynia that's um, unprovoked. So they have a more constant level of pain. Um, a lot of times uh, if they have urinary urgency or frequency on top of that, that will disrupt their sleep if they're waking at night. 
Now we all know how important sleep is when we have chronic pain, right? It, they feed into each other. So a lack of sleep makes your nervous system more sensitized. And when you have chronic pain, your nervous system is already centralized. It's that central sensitization where our amplifiers are turned up. Um, and the other sort of effects of central sensitization and our amplifiers being turned up with an upregulated nervous system is more, um, you know, our patients tend to catastrophize more and, and everything that goes along with that that we both see in our practices. So not, the fact that they wake up at night to pee is actually really significant because that's disrupting their sleep pattern, which is therefore affecting their nervous system. So um, that is also appropriate for us to see. And um, I like to always just make the point that because we're looking beyond just the pelvic floor, as I've discussed, looking at other orthopedic issues, that your best pelvic floor PT is going to be somebody that also says they are a good orthopedic PT. So as pelvic PTs, we are thinking about other structures in the area and what other drivers we may be dealing with um, for their, their pain or their dysfunction. So we really have to have a broad scope as a pelvic PT and not just be narrowed in on the pelvic floor muscles themselves. And, you know, I see patients all the time that maybe moved to, you know, from a different area and they were seeing a pelvic PT where they were and now they're trying to reestablish locally with a new one. And, you know, maybe some improvement in their symptoms and they were hesitant to maybe even try again, but wanted a different perspective. And almost universally, I see that the pelvic floor is evaluated and the pelvic floor is treated. But what is not looked at is like the hips and the back. And then, the, so since those aren't evaluated, they're also not treated. So we do have to keep all musculoskeletal and postural components in mind when we are treating um, any sort of female sexual dysfunction. Female sexual dysfunction is under the bigger umbrella of pelvic floor dysfunction, and physical therapy should be considered in every single um, case of uh, sexual pain. So myofascial pain has been shown in the research to be present in 85% of women with urologic, colorectal, and gynecologic pain syndromes. Um, so I think I misspoke there. I said it should be considered a component um, I meant to say in every person with pelvic floor dysfunction, because we're talking almost eight, up to 85% of women have um, myofascial pain in addition to their other symptoms in that pelvic area. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something that should be on the forefront of everybody's mind, not the back of everybody's mind. Uh, we also know that pain begets pain, and the presence of one chronic pain condition is a well-established predictor for onset of a new pain condition. And part of that is due to that neuronal crosstalk that I talked about earlier, central sensitization. And we know that um, women with chronic pain tend to not just have one chronic pain. They tend to have at least one or more other chronic pain condition or um, a, what is termed a chronic overlapping pain condition or a COPC. Um, so someone with vulvodynia has a high incidence of also having interstitial cystitis, um, or vice versa, I should say. And um, however, also women with vulvodynia tend to have a fairly um, common incidence of oral facial pain or TMJ dysfunction. So, you know, I'm talking to my patients about not, you know, not grinding and trying to give them some like breathing techniques that help open and relax their jaw because they hold so much tension up here as well as working on the local effects of their pelvic floor to decrease tension. Um, so we have nearly 100% um, of women that have interstitial cystitis in this one study um, by Gardella also report having one of these other two types of vulvodynia. Nearly 100%. What is that total? I think like 97.9% .9 if I did my quick math correctly. So um, that's, that's incredible. Another study reported it was more like 48%. So even on a low end, 48% to 100%. We obviously need to be... Um, sort of keeping other things in mind. Your client may be coming to you with vulvodynia, but they might have some urinary symptoms. And if those urinary symptoms are not addressed, then a component of their treatment plan is being missed as well. Um, 
these three I lumped together because they're mentioned so frequently in the literature together as being part of these chronic overlapping pain conditions. A lot of times they're called the evil triplets uh, just because they are found together so often. Um, and also in the literature, the psychosocial factors are just repeated, like the same psychosocial factors with all three of these diagnoses. And of course, you're helping um, as sex therapists impact each of these um, categories of psychosocial functioning and quality of life. And as physical therapists, we may be looking at like the dysfunction or the pain, um, but in turn, how we, how addressing those issues will help the other areas as well. And we can also help recognize when they're catastrophizing. So working with a sex therapist in, you know, what, what sort of tools are being utilized by them, we can help support that in our therapy sessions as well um, to just help with uh, downtraining their nervous system and addressing those psychosocial factors. Um, we also know that sexual assault victims are 2.5 four times more likely to have sexual dysfunction, including pain being a part of that, and 2.7 times more likely to have pelvic floor dysfunction. And this is compared to non-victimized uh, non controls. So what is the role of a pelvic floor physical therapist specifically? I've sort of told you what we can do, but now I want to tell you how we do that. And this will help set up an expectation for your clients too, if they're fearful of coming to a practice um, to help kind of set up what we do, at least in my offices, what our um, general protocols are. And I put quotes on there because again, I do call myself a pelvic floor physical therapist to differentiate myself from like a sports physical therapist, but it really does narrow the scope of our care that we're providing. And, you know, people often tell me, oh, I didn't, I didn't know you treated backs. They're, they're really surprised that I can treat a back. And then I have to explain to them, well, actually, you know, really I treat everything because there are other components to people's pain or dysfunction that comes from areas away from their pelvic floor. So I actually have to know how to treat everything in order to treat the pelvic floor. But by calling myself a pelvic floor PT, it confuses even some of my, um, even some of my closest friends. So it's a constant educational process. So our number one goal when they come in is to build trust and confidence immediately. We, we have to understand um, and have a responsiveness to, to the impact of trauma that emphasizes their physical, their psychological, and their emotional safety for both providers and survivors. And that really creates opportunities for survivors to rebuild a sense of trust with us. So I define trauma as any negative impact on their body and any perceived negative impact. So it does not have to be sexual abuse, although of course that can be a form of trauma. It can also come in the form of a first gynecologic exam that was really painful. So that is now a trauma that they have perceived. Or it could be a series of urinary tract infections that, um, you know, urinary tract infections are painful. So it could just be, you know, the pain associated with that. And now they have a negative association um, of pain in um, in that part of their body. And when you have a negative association or experience in that part of your body, it will um, start to create some muscle guarding and some muscle overactivity um, in the muscles uh, of the region. And in turn, when muscles are guarded or overactive in a chronic state, they will start to lose flexibility over time. And then you think about trying to have intercourse, for example, if the muscles do not stretch because they have lost flexibility, because they, they are muscles just like any other muscles in our body, like our, like our hamstrings and our quads, muscles do require to be stretched. And if there's like a fear and guarding response um, on top of uh, underlying lack of flexibility, then um, that does have to be addressed. And this is why just doing, um, sort of, you know, mindfulness, or as some doctors will erroneously uh, prescribe to their doctors, just have a glass of wine, you just need to relax. There is a physical component to these women's sy symptoms. And on the previous slide, as we noted, 85%, up to 85% of women have a have myofascial pain um, that have uh, urologic, colorectal, or gynecologic conditions. So um, we have to address that whole system. Um, 
to start achieving these goals, we start by first listening to our patients. So it really starts with the interview and maybe it's even a phone call that they make to our office before because they just want to understand what we're doing and have some you know, expectation from us and how our office, our, our office evaluates and manages their particular dysfunction. Um, we want them to feel really safe in their environment. We are working towards building trust and letting them know that they have the support of just not me, but of our entire staff. And we develop a treatment plan together with them through collaboration. And we let them know that they always have a choice in their program that we develop. And that all the choices we're making are individualized for them. We're taking into account um, you know, any cultural considerations or any gender issues. Um, uh, for example, you know, we, this, uh, lecture is about female sexual dysfunction, but it's really, uh, it should be a lecture for anybody that identifies themselves as female. So we do see transgender patients that may have a neo-vagina, um, or sort of, you know, a newly reconstructed vagina, um, or non-transgender patients, you know, we see women that were actually, uh, born without a vagina. So they in turn also may have a surgery that creates a vaginal canal for them. So, um, you know, we are just very sensitive to everybody's background, um, what their history is. And when I developed this interview style, I did use the SAMHSA trauma informed guidelines because of the history that I know so many of our patients come with. And I know I um, been talking about this a lot, but just that we have our scope beyond the pelvic floor. And if you have a client that has only had their pelvic floor evaluated, for example, by like their gynecologist or their pelvic PT, um, and therefore only had their pelvic floor treated, that their evaluation and their treatment plan should be considered incomplete. Um, because that is not the that is not the big picture. As we already know, things that are further north of our pelvic floor can contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, how we evaluate on a physical exam is actually in two parts. So I always tell patients it's a two-part orthopedic exam. The first part is more of a general orthopedic exam. It's what you might experience when you are going to a physical therapist for back or hip pain, right? We're looking at posture, we're looking at muscle imbalances between the, the ribs and the knees because we're looking at muscles that attach to the pelvis and that would be the muscles between the ribs and the knees. Um, we're looking at strength, flexibility, um, coordination differences, um, posture, um, mechanics maybe, like how they bend over, how they squat, how they walk. Um, so we're, we have to do a general exam to see if there's anything there that could be contributing to their pelvic floor symptoms. And then the second part that we do is a pelvic floor muscle exam. And that is um, where we're looking at the structures and identifying um, and, uh, what dysfunction is present locally. And more on that in a little bit. Um, the other general, our other general role is to educate them a lot, educate them a lot about their specific diagnosis, but also about what we have determined is driving their pain. We need to educate them on their treatment plan. They have to understand why they're coming to see us, what the goals are. We set, we, we, um, set goals and we check in on our goals frequently. And the goals are not just our goals, they're goals that we develop with the patient through collaboration. And um, and we make sure that we are meeting certain markers and that they have no um, questions about their treatment at, at any time along the way. I mean, I would say any, any patient that I see is very clear about what I think is going on in their body and what the steps are that we are going to achieve to um, reach those goals. Um, essential part of education is teaching them a home program. And if it's a female sexual pain, then often this will include use of uh, dilators. Um, and that would be an essential part of their program. But it might also be doing certain like low back or hip stretches or maybe certain core strengthening. You know, it really all depends on what their diagnosis is and what we um, determine sort of are the most important like primary factors that need to be addressed and what are more like secondary and tertiary factors that we can address down the line. And, you know, there's nobody that should only just be doing dilators um, as a long-term program. In the, in the beginning, if they have vaginismus, yes. Dilators is where we almost always try to start, and that's maybe their primary focus for the first six weeks. But, um, you know, as a bigger picture, they also know that we will be addressing the other dysfunctions that we found on their initial visit or their initial couple of visits um, that, we, that we 
found and discussed with them. So the treatment is home-based as well as in-office based. And typically our treatments will start locally where we think the main source of the pain is, which may be the pelvis or the lumbar spine, for example. But then we take a more global approach so that we're addressing the big picture. Um, we go over resources with them from the very beginning. So um, I you know, have a list that I will provide with patients or, you know, maybe just email them some of these resources and recommendations as we go along um, so that they can just better educate themselves through the process. Because even though we have 90 minutes with them on an initial and we spend the full hour with them for their follow-ups, there's, there's still a lot of information we can give them and that they can sort of do, you know, have independent support outside of our PT sessions. Um, we also educate them on you know, I, as I mentioned, dilators, but we help them determine which dilator they should use. There's so many different types of dilators out there. I mean, wh where would they begin? If they're being told by their doctor, um, oh yeah, you have, um, you have ulvodynia, use a, use a dilator. And then they search dilators, they're gonna come up with these options and more. What, which one are they gonna use and why? Um, so we help educate them and help them find a, um, the most appropriate dilator for their condition. We also educate them on the different types of lubricants. Sometimes our patients have sensitivities to certain types of lubricants and, um, you know, like a KY jelly, for example, but that's really all they've tried and some patients haven't even thought to try something different. Or maybe they've tried, you know, KY, that didn't work and they read online they should try olive oil. But they sort of feel weird about using olive oil, but they're using it because it doesn't bother them. So we can give them all these other options that they um, can try from um, aloe-based to, uh, you know, maybe like a coconut oil that's packaged as a lubricant. Uh, to other water-based alternatives, to silicone and vitamin E-based alternatives, to CBD-based alternatives. So we help them determine all of those. Um, we also um, can recommend products for them to use um, at this early stage. Um, the picture I have here up on the top right is called an O-Nut, and it's basically a penile depth limiter, but I use this with my um, with my same-sex patients too that are using dildos, for example, if they still want to have penetrative intercourse and they're fine with initial penetration but their pain is deeper inside, the O-nut or a, or a collision ring, as you might generically hear it called, um, can be a great option for them to still experience and be intimate but not have that deeper pain um, because of that depth limitation. The, the penis or the dildo just won't reach that level because of these um, silicone depth limiters. So I've been talking all this time about pelvic floor PT and pelvic floor problems, but what is the pelvic floor? And you know why is it so important to our clients? And if you look at these five bullets, these are really the five main functions of the pelvic floor. And how devastating would it be if we lost bladder function, bowel function, um, our ability to have an orgasm or we had pain with orgasm, uh, if we lost support of our organs or we were having an issue with our posture. And the pelvic floor is uh, contributes to all of these things and has been shown in research to contribute to all of these things. So um, specifically, we know that at any level, of pain, whether you think about superficial muscles, which are right at the entrance, so it would be penetrative pain, or pain with um, deep thrusting, which would be the intermediate or deep layer of the pelvic floor, um, but all layers of the pelvic floor muscle can contribute to pain. And, and specifically in the research, the middle layer of pelvic floor muscles have been um, shown to be involved in maintaining continence and providing lumbopelvic stability. So again, pelvic floor muscles are contributing to lumbar stability. So I hope there's a really clear connection to everybody here by this point that you really have to think about what's going on beyond the pelvic floor. And that's what we're doing as pelvic PTs is thinking about that broader function. Um, the deepest layer, so um, the one sort of up closest to the, the uterus or you know, deep vaginal um, area has been shown to not just also contribute incontinence, but help with um, having bowel movements or preventing having bowel movements and also help support our organs and help stabilize the sacrum and the tailbone. So um, it has, you know, its role in, in those functions as well. 
So what specifically um, is going on in our initial valuation? So I just want you to kind of get a picture of that as I'm um, going through. So we talked about sort of our, our trauma-informed approach to care, but beyond that, we are taking an extensive history, and I've really summarized it um, as briefly as I could for you all here, but we really want to know how their symptoms began and have they gotten better, worse, or about the same over time. We take an inventory on not just their sexual symptoms, but also their bowel and bladder symptoms. Um, and I didn't type it up here, but we also take an inventory on other symptoms. Do they have hip pain? Do they have back pain? Do they have, do they have TNJ? You know, anything. They might not think it's related, but, but these are, are all overlapping conditions. We're looking at their past medical and surgical history. We're looking at um, past effective and ineffective treatments, medications that they're currently on, as well as former medications that they may have used, such as over um, on oral contraceptive pills. Um, and what other providers have they tried in the past? And what providers do they have as a current part of their team? And this intake, sometimes if they're really complicated, might take 45 minutes, which is why we do a 90-minute evaluation. Um, if they're a little more straightforward, we might get through all of this in less than 20 minutes and have more time to evaluate them, um, do the physical examination, and then also provide treatment. So that is the goal of every 90-minute session. If they're on time, we can evaluate them um, through um, their oral history, do our physical exam, and still provide treatment and start their home program in most cases. So Muscle-wise, I mentioned we're looking at the muscles between the ribs and the knees. So I wanted you all to see this because you're sex therapists and you're not used to thinking about these sorts of things. But look at all these muscles here. Get my cursor. So we've got a lot of muscles between the ribs and the knees. And look at how they all attach to the pelvis. And that's why we have to look at all of them. If they have um, uh, you know, low back pain, that's obviously going to contribute to their pelvic pain. We know it from the research, but hopefully you just seeing that, you can understand how um, anatomically that would be possible. You know, even look at this muscle here, um, our, our hip flexors that originate from the lumbar spine and look at where it crosses. It crosses the pelvic region and um, attaches to the hip to bring our, our knee and thigh closer to our torso. That would be hip flexion. So we have to address this whole system as well um, in our evaluation. We think about the bony structures and the joints. So we're looking at the, the sacrum and the coccyx, right? That's what that deeper layer of the pelvic floor helps stabilize, but we're looking at it from the outside. Um, are there any alignment issues um, within the pelvis itself or where the pelvis meets the sacrum here? Um, we're looking at hip anatomy and we're you know, thinking back to our history, did they say they have hip pain? Do they have a diagnosis for that hip pain? Maybe do they have arthritis or do they have a labral tear in their hip? Do they maybe have a herniated disc? And are there symptoms, there may be upper lumbar symptoms if their herniated disc is up there, that might be contributing to labial pain or clitoral pain. So, um, you know, we're, we're assessing posture, bones, and joints as well in our evaluation. We're also looking at the pelvic organs. We want to know if they are, um, you know, tipped one way, for example, if there's good mobility of the tissue um, or of the organ, I should say, um, if they have like a constipation history. Um, patients that have a history of constipation, for example, that will affect their urinary symptom. It can sort of increase their likelihood of having urgency and frequency just because of the, the full bowels pushing on the bladder. Um, or it can weaken their muscles over time if they're straining a lot. So we, we do it like an organ assessment and over the bowels, we can actually feel like patients that are constipated, they're often their like left lower belly feels really firm because that's where the, the constipation had sort of stuck, um, you know, as a sort of simple way to describe that. We're also looking at the fascia around the viscera and seeing if that reproduces their symptom. So all of this white stuff here is fascia around the organ. And we can um, tell if there's any disruption or um, dysfunction or like limitation or restriction in that tissue through an internal um, assessment, but also abdominally we can um, assess for that. Everyone in my office has had training on 
visceral or like visceral fascial work. So assessing that and seeing if it reproduces their symptom, whether it's pain or, um, or um, other dysfunction uh, are, are very important. Another huge thing is looking at peripheral nerves. So these would be um, the nerves that branch off of our central nervous system. Um, we can do tension testing of various nerves to see if it recreates uh, their symptoms. Um, peripheral nerves that originate well north of their pelvis can be responsible for pelvic floor symptoms. And again, I mentioned this before, 12th thoracic, first lumbar, second lumbar, um, those can contribute to labial pain or clitoral pain. So has their back been looked at, if that's their symptom? Um, these patients will really beat themselves up and think that they have tried everything because they've gone through the gamut of ultrasound and gynecologic exams and pelvic MRI and pelvic PT, but their pain may actually be coming from their first lumbar and has anybody looked at their back to see if they have um, any contribution higher up or like I say, well north of the pelvic floor. So you as a sex therapist may actually be the one that can identify this in some sense. And we'll go over more in a little bit how, but you spend an hour with them. So you can really observe a lot about their like static and movement function that might give you a clue to um, if there is a missing component to their, their pain. We're also looking at the central nervous system. Um, you know, we start with a local focus maybe, but we think globally about, you know, does this person have central sensitization? Or in a way to summarize that, if you're not familiar with that term, is, you know, are, are they upregulated? Are there, are there amplifiers turned on, so to speak? Do they perceive a, a light, non-painful stimuli, a non-painful touch? as painful and that's one indicator that they may be upregulated along with the other sort of behavioral characteristics of catastrophizing um, or just you know being really anxious um, you know we are assessing that and treating it within our scope and working usually with a team of other providers so whether they're being medically managed um, with like a gabapentin or being managed with psychotherapy or sex therapy um, through using sort of autonomic nervous system down training techniques. We use those, um, our own techniques in office um, to help assist that as well. But we have to keep that in mind and we are assessing that as a component as well. Also, I love this picture because it so also clearly illustrates why we can't just think of a pelvic floor problem as a pelvic floor problem and how you can just help support that knowledge in your sessions with patients. So look at the back of this um, woman. Okay, we have L1 dermatome up here in the back, but look at where it is in the front, okay, diving down towards the genitals. Who would have thought, if you didn't understand anatomy, that our, something happening in our first lumbar vertebrae could be giving us groin pain. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that a symptom in our calf um, could be coming from our pelvic floor? So we are assessing really head to toe. We have to um, in order to make sure that we're not missing any part of their pain syndrome. So that's all really part of a, of a general orthopedic exam, that, that phase one. In phase two, we um, have them undress from the waist down, and we step out of the room while they're doing this. And before I have them do that, I do explain to them what I'm going to be doing during the pelvic floor physical exam. And it's always done with consent, and it's always, you know, they basically know what we're doing every step of the way. And if they're really just adverse to any um, internal assessment, intravaginal or intrarectal, depending on what their symptoms are, um, we can still do an external assessment, but we do need to start the education of their anatomy at this point. So we want to make sure patients are using the right words, um, vulva versus vagina. And so if we see something, we, we define for them, you know, if, if we think it's a vulva issue versus a vaginal issue, because many women will call their vulva their vagina and vice versa, and they are two different anatomical structures the vulva is outside and the vagina is inside. Where they meet is called the vestibule. So I love this visual that a colleague of mine in Florida um, had posted on her Instagram. So I'm giving her credit here, but it's just such a perfect way for patients to learn their anatomy and make sure that they're using the appropriate terms. 
Also, we can help dispel fears that they may have that there's something abnormal about them. Because I can tell you in most cases, I mean, you know, 99.99% of my patients have had 100% perfectly normal anatomy. But normal, there's not one norm. There's a variation of norms. So I'll give them this website as a resource if they would just like to see, hey, there are variations of normal and, um, and you are perfectly normal. There is nothing wrong with your vulva. You have, you have normal vaginal anatomy. It's just that the structures in the area are dysfunctional, but it doesn't mean, dysfunctional does not mean untreatable. And in most cases, these women can be successfully treated. Um, again, looking at the pelvic floor from a more local perspective, um, again, with the, uh, the upper lumbar component, just to illustrate again, right, our L1, L1, L2, look at where they may experience symptoms, all right? Just to orient you, this is the mons pubis or the pubic bone up here at the top of the screen. Um, the clitoris, the urethra, the vaginal opening, if you're following my cursor down towards the bottom of the screen, and the anus. So they may have symptoms up here with the first lumbar or second lumbar um, problem. All of this through here is sacral, um, sacral nerve roots, but look over here, the lateral, the lateral buttocks can, it also comes from L1, 2, and 3. Um, and patients will find it weird. Like I also, I also hurt here, but I hurt here. And that's a huge red flag that there is probably some can, contribution um, from their, their lumbar spine. So when we're doing our inspection, we're looking at um, the external structures, like the skin. We can also palpate it externally, especially if they're really adverse to um, a uh, uh, transvaginal or transrectal examination. Um, but for muscle function, um, as far as like testing flexibility or resting state, the best way to do that is through an internal assessment. But we can get some valuable information by looking at things externally as well. Um, we're not just looking at strength, just so you know, and a huge myth that needs to be dispelled is, you know, that you should do kegels because kegels are not the answer for everything. And in fact, I would say with most types of female sexual dysfunction, they will actually make the problem worse because these women have short, tight muscles. And if you're contracting them all the time, you're just going to make them shorter and tighter. So that's part of our assessment is trying to determine, are these muscles short and tight? Um, do they need some techniques to help reduce the tension in that area um, before we start doing pelvic floor contractions or kegels and before we start doing other strengthening of uh, structures that we felt might be, um, might be weak. Um, additionally, we are assessing, yes, how well it contracts, but also how well it relaxes. And we are also just looking at overall coordination. When we ask them to, we'll ask them to bear down, like they're having a bowel movement, but some women contract. So that is called a dyssynergic pattern, and we can work to help, um, help them coordinate that function in the future. And then we're also assessing other muscles in the area too. Um, which is sort of, sort of that ribs to knees assessment. So um, internally, though, I'm checking like hip rotators here and here. Um, this is always a, a hot muscle in a lot of patients that have sexual dysfunction and chronic pelvic pain. It's called the obturator internus. And it connecting here to that mid layer, the levator ani muscle group through a tendon. So Hopefully this gives you a visual of how hip dysfunction, because obturator internus is a hip rotator muscle, can lead to and contribute to pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. Um, so I just wanted to put this slide up so that you could see that um, anatomic correlation. Um, when we're assessing strength at the layer of the levator ani muscle, this is very important in patients with uh, female sexual dysfunction um, and helping to determine whether the muscles are guarded or overactive or if they might be underactive. So just as an example, a woman with dysorgasmia or a painful orgasm, we tend to find that they have overactivity of this muscle, um, trigger points. Uh, it feels like really rigid and inflexible. Um, 
if they have a weak orgasm. So I'll see women that say, you know, my orgasms just aren't as good as they used to. Um, they'll, also, they'll have a lot of weakness there, or they might have an incoordination. So they think they've been practicing and doing their kegels. And what they've actually been doing is straining and pushing down. I call it an anti-kegel. And if you don't exercise a muscle properly, then the muscles will not get stronger. I always tell patients, if you want really strong triceps, which are the muscle in the back of your shoulder, you can't do bicep curls. That's not going to help your triceps. So you have to know how to exercise a muscle specifically in order for it to get stronger. So we can help those women um, improve their coordination and then on top of that, start to improve their strength. Um, fascia can also be important um, in the sexual response and it's been theorized that Halbin's fascia may play a role in you know, one thing, if women talk about their orgasms maybe changing after they've had um, a surgery to this area, like a hysterectomy or a, or a bladder sling, um, perhaps part of their sexual pleasure was arriving from this fascia, and maybe that was disrupted during the surgery. So, you know, it's just a, an indicator um, and a piece of the history that I'm looking for. Um, but if that's not intact, there's, there's nothing that physical therapy um, would do for that if it's disrupted. So, um, I have no idea how we're doing on time, but I'm going to wrap this up really quickly for you all. And I'm happy to go a little over an hour if people want to stay. But why is this important for you as sex therapists? Because you are here with them for an entire hour and you can observe so much. Um, for example, when you're sitting with them for an hour, are they, are they standing up to go to the bathroom? Uh, you know, are, are they needing to go to the bathroom maybe once or twice during that hour? Um, you know, a urinary problem, right, an urgency or a frequency problem, or maybe a fear that they might um, leak, that will be tied to their sexual dysfunction that they are coming to you to see. Um, do you see them shifting around in their seat because they say, like, their tailbone hurts or their back hurts? Um, when they stand up at the end of the hour, are they having a difficult time standing up? Like, you know, you can say, oh, hey, what's wrong? I noticed that looks a little uncomfortable for you. And they might say, yeah, my, my hip, like, has just really been bothering me the past couple years. Um, I don't know what's wrong with it. Um, we, so we know that hip dysfunction can contribute to female sexual dysfunction. And you can follow up, have you seen anybody for that? And, you know, yes, maybe they need to be evaluated by an orthopedist for that, but also um, a pelvic PT, you know, they can be sent from their internal med doctor to PT to address their hip and see if their hip dysfunction is contributing to their pelvic floor dysfunction. So um, it's just really important for you as um, part of their provider team to just help make observations because they may come straight from their gynecologist to you because the gynecologist does not think that there's a physical component to their pain, but I hope you've learned this hour that there, are, there may be multiple physical components to their pain. Also, we get this question a lot, how long until I'm better? And honestly, it depends. We see patients most time, um, mostly one time per week, um, providing this long list of exercises and treatment um, approaches. But um, at once a week, most patients, if they have pain, will typically notice some improvement within one to four weeks. Um, if they have more of a uh, pure like weakness or low tone disorder, then that might take four to six weeks just because we need time to get the muscles stronger and more supportive for them to find a change in their symptoms. So that can give you something to help them set up expectations. And also my last question I'll answer is if I don't use it, do I lose it? And I get this question all the time and women are so scared about losing their sexual function. So I'll answer these real quick in two ways. One, if they have weakness or low tone, um, it's not lost, it's misplaced. They can build up their strength and help restore their sexual function. Um, with regards to maybe uh, sexual pain, um, you know, I'll have women who say I haven't had sex in a while, um, or maybe they're postmenopausal and they're really fearful. I even had a woman a couple of weeks ago tell me her gynecologist said, as she was going through menopause, you need to make sure you're still having sex because if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And here she is in my office, 10 minutes later, mortified um, and so anxious about this pain that she has, and she's afraid that she has lost it. But again, you know, we evaluate it. There's usually a lot musculoskeletally going on that's contributing to their pain, so we can help them find it again. And we just need you all as part of our team to help develop, um, uh, to help develop the optimal treatment plan for them. Uh, here's some resources for you that you can access. 
Um, and also anybody that's here at this webinar um, will, can get 30% off if you want my book, Sex Without Pain. The wording on here, just so you know, is for cisgender female um, patients. So cis female patients, but it would be applicable also to anybody with a vagina or a neo-vagina. And um, any one from CHS, if you don't have a copy of my book, I know some of you do, I'm happy to actually just mail your offices, however many copies you would like, so that you can get a print copy. But anybody watching this webinar can get 30% off. And that is it. And thank you for your time. And I'm sorry I ran a little bit over with my lecture, but I'm happy to stay and answer questions. All right, um, let me read, okay, one just popped up. So I heard that dilators, the medical industry are currently using are bad. Do you agree? If so, why? And do you see them changing what they use anytime soon? You know what? I'm, I think I need a little bit more, um, I need a little more detail if whoever submitted that question can follow up uh, because I think that dilators are not bad when they're appropriately used. Um, and you know, there are different types of dilators. So if you have really sensitive tissue, for example, if you've had uh, radiation after cancer and you're trying to use a rigid dilator, then I would say that that is bad. That's not an appropriate use of um, dilators in that case. Um, you would tend to want to use a, a silicone dilator that's a little softer. Um, you know, people need parameters with using dilators because you can certainly be overly aggressive with them and you're not going to damage the tissue, but if you are already upregulated, um, if your nervous system, um, it, it, you know, if you have that central sensitization, then using them inappropriately could just just keep on turning up those amplifiers, those pain sensors, and you might feel like it's making you worse. But I would not say dilators in themselves are bad because they have, I mean, it's what's gotten the majority of my sexual pain patients out of pain um, as being uh, a component of their home program. Um, is there an assessment tool for female, female dysfunction disorder? So yes, there are, I, I'm assuming you mean like questionnaires. So in my office, we use um, the female sexual function index. Um, and sometimes I kind of go back and forth. I'm still trying to decide which one I'm finding more clinically relevant to my practice, just because that FSFI is really long and um, I have not been able to find an automatic scoring tool for that. So it takes a long time to score. Um, the PISQ-IR, which um, pelvic impact and symptom questionnaire, um, dash IR, hmm, I'm blanking on what the IR stands for, but that um, also, I, I kind of like that better because it has um, some bowel and bladder function as well as addresses the sexual component. So those would be a couple of um, good general assessment tools that, um, that I would, would um, recommend using. Um, oh, Someone was curious about the view when I had the visceral slide up, what the yellow and orange blotches were on the colon. They were asking if it was muscle. So um, that's just fatty deposits because we have fat in our, in our pelvic organs, um, you know, surrounding them, cushioning them. So that was just some fat, I believe, if I'm remembering the image correctly. So I see every I see the questions in the chat, and um, but I, I haven't seen the Q and A part um, pop up. So Doug, I don't know if there was anything there that I'm just not seeing. Um, let me see if any other questions have come through. Oh, okay, I like this question. What are some simple Kegel exercises you would recommend we do more often, assuming APT approves? Which I love that because. Um, Right, I might not approve if they have an overactive pelvic floor, which I think if anybody is having pain of any time, just assume until being told otherwise that they should not be doing Kegels because their muscles are probably overactive and short. And again, the Kegels will just feed into that cycle and could make their symptoms worse or just not improve at all. Um, oh, my question jumped up, hold on. Okay, I lost part of the question in the chat, but I think um, you were just asking what are some Kegel exercises you would do. So on my website on feminapt.com, I have a um, resource tab that has 
articles that I have that I've published. And one of those published articles was in the International Journal, um, in, I'm sorry, the International Childbirth Education Association's journal. And it's called sort of what to do the first six weeks after delivery. And in that article, I have a very simple uh, Kegel uh, progression, which basically starts with um, holding it gently for um, three to five seconds and doing 10 to 12 of those um, in series and really just starting with 40 to 60 a day and then building up from there, um, working on the endurance aspect. Uh, when doing a Kegel exercise, it, it's really important to let your clients know that you should not see anything. If they're sitting there in their chair and you see that they're, they're, they're moving or their stomach is really gripping or something, they're not doing a Kegel right. I don't know what they're doing until I assess them, but they're not doing it right. So really emphasize the subtlety of that contraction and that it should feel very small, very isolated, um, maybe not small, but it should feel very isolated without their bottom clenching, without their abdominals uh, bulging out, and without their legs squeezing together. I hope that helps answer that question. Um, let me see if any other questions. Um, okay, I'm just going to read this whole thing. It's a long question, so I'll, let me see. The description of the webinar mentioned multidisciplinary teams and tools we should use in recovery. In an ideal situation, would our clients have an MFT, a PT, and a massage therapist? If money were no object, who else should they visit regularly? I realize that it depends on their ailments, but I guess what I'm asking is what should we all be doing ideally as preventative action? So, um, so I had mentioned, I didn't have a slide, I guess, that specifically, well, actually, I did have a portion of a slide that talked about multidisciplinary um, um, somewhere in the presentation. But ideally, if they have pain, pelvic PT, um, maybe a pain management physician or their gyneco gynecologist, someone that's helping managing, um, managing their pain from maybe a pharmacologic perspective, if they are adverse to um, pharmacology like that, then instead, you know, they can see their maybe like Chinese uh, medicine provider if they want to, or, you know, like a home homeopathic physician, you know, it doesn't have to be Western medicine, but, but generally something else that's helping address the nervous system and how we know pain affects the nervous system. Um, so things to help quiet that. Um, yes, um, massage therapy has actually been shown in research to have a positive effect on down training the nervous system. So I do refer to massage therapy as well and recommend my patients if they can't do it every week that they're at least trying to do it every other week because it just helps them so much in the moment and does provide some good carryover as well um, long after the session. Um, so I also work with um, a practice that does that really specializes in nervous system down training. So I send to psychotherapists that are really good um, with pain science and giving their patients tools to help um, to help manage, you know, their anxiety or their catastrophizing and helping them understand um, how to manage that basically. Uh, but I also have um, a team of providers that I refer out to that are a non-talk therapy based that do it through more like um, body experiential work. So that would be another provider. And, um, you know, sex therapy, of course, is always a component um, of their team, should there be no um, sort of financial restrictions. But it is a team because these, con these conditions are not acute conditions. Usually they've had painful sex, for example, for years, maybe decades. So it, it takes time and a team to undo it. And I really wish that our healthcare system provided more support and more financial support and more resources to help do that. Because unfortunately, patients do have to come out of pocket when they have this team of specialty providers. Oh, the best way to find a PT. Perfect. So, um, Go to pelvicpain.org if your client experiences that, and they have an international um, database of providers, both physicians, psychotherapists, and um, physical therapists that specialize in chronic pelvic pain. Um, you can also go to the Herman and Wallace Institute 
So Google that, um, I believe it, hermanwallace.com, but I can't recall off the top of my head. Um, that is just specific to pelvic physical therapists that have taken their courses. So you always want to, if you find someone local to your area, look at their website, give them a call, make sure they have the experience you need. Um, because just going to one or two courses for these chronic problems really isn't um, enough to provide um, sort of the full treatment that's required. Um, those would be the two main resources that, um, that patients can go to. Uh, as far as if they have like anorgasmia, you know, I, I don't have like a find a provider for that necessarily, except Herman and Wallace, we, we do do a lot of, um, or they do a lot of just training on sexual dysfunction. So they can at least find a physical therapist local to them. And then hopefully that local therapist does, um, have a network of referrals of psychotherapists and physicians or homeopathic providers that they can help get their patient on board with. Are we good? All right, perfect. Um, so thank you guys for coming. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. Um, I just, you know, get so excited talking about these things and can, uh, can talk forever as you see about this. But thank you all for having me. Thanks. Bye.